I have uh, essentially two, uh, two, two questions. The first one is uh, the uh, tax side was almost completely absent from the presentation. And uh, uh, for example, when we think about transfers, uh, if uh, some of the transfers to other poor people are financed out of uh, indirect taxation on consumption goods, uh, there are some calculations which are showing that when you look at the balance, the balance is negative. Uh, and it may be the case that the poor people are paying more in terms of uh, taxes uh, than they are receiving in terms of transfer. So it seems to me that uh, we cannot simply uh, push uh, the taxation uh, uh, thing aside and uh, uh, only uh, focus on, the, on transfers. The, my, my other uh, point is really about... Uh, Another thing, which another concept which I thought was missing, minimum wage, which uh, as a matter of fact, in the most Latin American country, there is a minimum wage. Now it is true that in Mexico, if I remember well, it is rather low, but uh, in a country like Colombia, it must be something like 70% of the median income, which is one of the highest in the world. Uh, and moreover, this is a, a, a legislation which is uh, very severely uh, controlled. So this is definitely a very important uh, element in uh, uh, determining informality or formality. And this leads me to another point, which is that, uh, and uh, I'm very much aware of that because in my country this has been a huge, huge uh, discussion, which is the fact that above the minimum wage, the uh, non-wage costs like uh, social uh, contributions uh, presumably, over time, in, at an equilibrium, will be passed on the workers, simply because if there is enough competition on the labor market uh, uh, above the minimum wage, let's say after two, twice the minimum wage. So the, the, the issue of, on the side of uh, uh, firms, the issue is very much linked uh, to the existence of minimum wage. And I think it is uh, really important to, to take that into account. And, more generally to uh, admit that there are other, uh, there are many other determinants of formality and formality than uh, the uh, status of uh, contributions. So I have a question for uh, Santiago Levy. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more on how the universal social protection systems could um, incentivize uh, people to move to formal uh, employment and um, also in relation to uh, taxes, because you also mentioned the example about the reduction in payroll taxes and how that had incentivized formality. But yeah, governments can only reduce payroll tax or any other taxes until a limit, because somewhere the taxes need to come from. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, just quickly, I think it's maybe important to distinguish between employment and self-employment. To remember that the bulk of the poor are really self-employed, meaning they are small farmers. And there are situations where social assistance to self-employed can be effective if it helps them build assets. In the case of Procampo, the assets were there. There was a large multiplier effect to the transfers. The BRAC approach is to build the assets first in such a fashion that the transfers be put to work on the assets that people accumulate. So I think we are maybe coming a bit too hard on the social assistance, and when we think of who the poor are, there may be more scope to use social assistance in a productive fashion, providing we use them in such a fashion as the assets are being built, as the transfers are being made. Uh, first of all, I wanted to, to thank the, uh, the participants because the challenge was already trying to gather all the information about uh, social protection, left aside trying to include taxes, so I think they did a, a great job. However, lots of things were left behind, and I wanted to mention two. Uh, one of the first ones is uh, related to eligibility and the use of proxy means testing. To which extent this is uh, creating problems in, or in order to target the, the poor? And to which extent can we move away from it uh, to an income test, at least in Latin America? Uh, and linked to this, uh, nothing was mentioned about uh, protection in the case of unemployment. Uh, so there's, uh, in some countries, there's the presence at least of uh, unemployment insurance. In some others, I think there's, we still have systems of severance payments only. Uh, 
And if you put together this with the fact that we have proxy means testing rather than means testing, for those who are not affiliated, actually there's no protection in case of unemployment. So which directions could we follow in this sense? I, I appreciate all the, um, all the efforts in gathering data and, and it's, uh, the, the three presentations were, were very good in that sense. Um, but I think we should perhaps go beyond coverage. Uh, I know it's hard to summarize multi-country evidence, but um, I think there's, uh, if, if we are, for example, you, Veronica mentioned the case of Brazil. If we're reducing a very regressive um, social insurance program for diplomats and, or in my case, scientific researchers in Argentina, which is outrageous in, in, in international uh, terms, is that bad? Uh, if we're reducing entitlements, if we're shifting them to um, cash transfers for poor children. So I think there's uh, uh, the issue of the budget constraint that Francois mentioned and, and, and how we're financing that. If uh, you're expanding programs that's not sustainable and then you end up in a macroeconomic crisis, that's also uh, not necessarily something good. Um, so I think we should try to go beyond coverage and talk a little bit about incidence in terms of income groups, but also in terms of age. I think in Latin America we've seen a great expansion for, all due respect, older people. Uh, and, and we can also consider what would have been the alternative use of funds. Paul Mosley, University of Sheffield. I'm, uh, this I'm fascinated by your vicious circle of informality and poverty induced by social protection story. But maybe it oversimplifies a bit because there are other determinants of formalization and productivity apart from just social protection. So in the Latin American country I know best, which is Bolivia, sure, in the sectors where informalization is increasing because of structural change, such as mining, yeah, productivity is falling there. On the other hand, there are other sectors such as construction and manufacturing where because of structural change, there is a tendency for formality and therefore productivity actually to rise. And so in spite of there having been a huge expansion of social protection, productivity overall across the entire economy is actually rising. So maybe the vicious circle isn't as prevalent as you say. Uh, the title of this session was social protection and aid, but I'm afraid we didn't hear too much about aid. So, so I wonder if the panelists could give us some of the insights about what the role of aid might be, because we all know it's, it's becoming fashionable also in aid circles to put some, some more resources to, to, to social protection in its various forms. So, so is that a good idea as such? Uh, if that's a good idea, what, what, what should be the specific role of aid? Is that the, the, the cash transfers are, of course, the big fat nowadays, but perhaps they should be, perhaps aid, aid funding should be used more like the, more like the, the purposes to, to which our commentator was referring to. And I, and I also wonder whether we have any reason to suspect that the programs, the aid finance programs might be somehow different from, from the other programs, either because of the funding modalities or different funding modalities or because of, of, of the different environments they are working in. Thanks. Uh, absolutely in agreement with Francois. I mean, uh, each country has a different institutionality. The minimum wage really matters a lot in Colombia. Uh, and clearly then the incidence of social security contributions is going to change because the minimum wage implies that it can be shifted back. So that clearly is part of the story. And also in, in, to, to link it with, with Paul, there are many other determinants of informality here. We have to talk about taxes. We have to talk about small tax regimes for small firms and large firms, about the size dependent tax regimes that are very, very prevalent in Latin America that are also a very important component of the fact that many firms remain small. I didn't speak about any of that because this was only on social insurance, but clearly the taxation side, the issues associated with access to credit, the issues associated with income taxation mattered importantly, and this was a way overly simplified, only focusing on social insurance. So if you wanted to do this more and more fully, 
this is what I actually try to do in the book, you, you, you have to look at the whole incentive structure coming not only from the social insurance part, but also have to look at the taxation part, the part associated with labor regulations, which nothing was mentioned here about uh, severance pay and all that stuff that also affects firm level choices. On Francois' point about looking at the overall system of taxation fully in agreement, what you want to do at the end of the day is look at the incidence of the structure of consumption taxes, labor taxes, and transfers, and the net of all that. And certainly what you want to do is, after you look at the net of all that, make sure that the net of all that is progressive. Not that each individual component by itself is progressive, but that the net of all that. As it stands today, I think that the system, I didn't speak much about that, but I agree, it's not really that distributive. It's not really that distributive. I think that at most, you know, maybe 1% of GDP is really being redistributed through all this. Uh, so, so that's another reason why I think the system is sort of not good. On, on Alan's question, I fully agree. I, I, perhaps I was misunderstood. My main query is not with social assistance or with poverty or transfers for poverty. That's not my main concern. My main concern is the dichotomy in social insurance that segments the labor market. Clearly, transfers to the poor can be translated into assets, land assets, like in the case of Procampo, human capital assets, like in the case of Progresa, and clearly you want to build our assets, both physical assets and human capital assets. The problem that I'm focusing on is that those assets, particularly the human capital assets that you're building through the targeted poverty programs, are not getting the rate of return that they should be getting in the labor market because not the social assistant component, the social insurance component is making that difficult. So, so fully in agreement that you know, we should focus on the, but we're not getting as much as we could potentially get from the building up of assets. And this is data that some study we did at the IDB is interesting. We've just done a 20 year longitudinal study of so the first cohorts of people that benefited from Progresa. And we're asking whether the labor market outcomes of those cohorts of people that have more human capital than their elders are better and with the exception of the people that migrated to the US, the answer is no. So it's a very sad story. It's a sad story that says, you've invested in all these human capital assets through social assistance, but the labor market is not allowing that these assets actually produce the rate of return they should be getting. So that's my main query. And I don't want to come hard on social assistance on the country, I want to come forward. So maybe I should stop there because of... Thank you. Well, I will, I will pick uh, some other questions to start with. There was a question about uh, eligibility and, and moving to income tests uh, instead of proximity tests. Uh, I'm not quite sure about that. I think that the targeting of the program in general terms has been working well. So uh, that was probably one of the things that we, what we learned in this period was how to implement these programs, how to target these, these programs. Um, about the question, Guillermo's question, if, if I, I understood his like, thinking about, well, we can change the architecture by other ways, by, for example, changing the benefits, and that probably would be a good idea, but we have there the political economy and the story of, of the development of social protection systems in Latin America shows the difficulties to do such things. So that, that I think we, we must take those, that into account when discussing these issues. And I, I completely agree that, first of all, that we, we left aside taxes and, and minimum wages, and there were important changes, for example, in the case of Latin America, also in the Southern Con, in Uruguay, in Argentina, uh, in, in Brazil, increases in real minimum wages were very important. and in this period they did not have the uh, potential adverse effects because they were uh, equality enhancing and, and the labor market was very dynamic in this period, but it was a special context in the region. Um, so, and I cannot comment on it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so my, my two minutes, I'm going to be really brief. Um, um, go, going back to Ellen's, uh, Ellen's point, um, the, uh, our discussant, I think it's really important. Um, uh, s basic services, education, healthcare, housing, and so on, are perhaps even much more important than transfers in cash. 
Uh, but this is not what we what was the theme of the panel today. But she makes the really important point that we need to get that right too. And perhaps that is, it should have priority. On the tax side, I think it's important, but um, for um, most low and middle income countries, I think we could, we could take the basic assumption that the, the tax transfer system is neutral in its effects. And all the kind of work that the CEQ uh, um, kind of initiative with Nora Lustig is producing for different countries shows that tax transfer systems are, are roughly neutral, basically because low and middle income countries don't have significant personal income tax. So basically, if, if most of the tax is collected through consumption taxes and, and you know, a com a company, company taxation, corporate taxation is perhaps the only element that is more, that is more progressive. So perhaps neutral is, is what we should, we should assume. Um, with Javier's sort of points about um, whether we should worry about the, the, the specific way in which we do eligibility tests, I'm really not concerned so much about that. I think the, the key issue is, is the, the regularity with which this eligibility test is done. Because if you look at most low and middle income countries, you, you measure poverty at one point in time, on one day in the year when you, get, when you do a survey. But the numbers of people that pass through poverty in the course of one year are significantly higher. So if you have, if you have a, a method that identifies eligibility every two years, it's never going to, it's never going to um, do proper targeting. And I think that is the point that Martin Ravelin was doing in the morning. Perhaps we should worry much more about the regularity, rather than finding methods of eligibility that can be implemented at much closer uh, uh, a, a space in time. On, uh, uh, finally, uh, sorry, two things. On the integration of social insurance and social assistance, I am skeptical about that. Uh, I have a nice picture at home that I look at it every so often where you, you have, the f uh, in, this is in Brazil, in Brasilia, in the federal government building, you have the federal police inside and you have the state, um, um, uh, state police outside uh, demonstrated against the change in pensions. And so you have two, two elements of the Brazilian police, which is you know, pretty, pretty fearsome, fighting against each other. They are, the, the state police are breaking the windows and the federal police inside are trying to protect parliament. I think it's really hard to do this because you're going to have to reduce significantly the, the very generous benefits that go to social insurance. So I'm skeptical about, about integration. I think it sounds better in terms of rules and regulations, but it's really hard in terms of the politics of it. Finally, on aid, um, I'm, I'm going to get into trouble here, but um, um, uh, what is the role of uh, 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 international assistance uh, in, 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 in supporting social assistance? I think anything that has to do with public goods is, is helpful. Uh, for example, the rapid response uh, initiative of the bank, which is a, uh, the World Bank, which is uh, rapidly improving the capacity in low-income countries for uh, implementing social assistance is a, good, is a very good thing. Uh, the protection to uh, promotion uh, initiative that provides information on um, the effectiveness of social assistance in low-income countries is also a very good thing because they're probably goods. We're learning how to make, how to do poverty. But I'm afraid a lot of the uh, F international efforts, particularly the UN, focuses on, on, on policy, on a, poli on a policy bubble. And that is, I, I think we're at the point where it's really unhelpful. And I wish they took a vacation. I mean, sa saving the world must be really tiring. Why don't you take a vacation for a bit? And I think low and middle income countries are doing really well. Just, just, just leave, leave things as they are. Uh, I know I'm going to get into trouble for that. Thank you.